Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, presented by Associates for Biblical Research. I'm your host, Henry Smith. Today, Nate Loper of Canyon Ministries joins us to talk about the Grand Canyon and Noah's Flood. Now, Nate is also here today to tell us why Canyon Ministries can provide you with the learning experience of a lifetime. Nate, welcome to Digging for Truth. Thanks for being on the show. Well, thank you, Henry. It's uh, absolutely a pleasure to be here. Well, Nate, you know, uh, we've communicated quite a bit over the last couple of years by email and Facebook, gotten acquainted, but this is our fir your first time on our television show. We're glad, uh, we're certainly glad that uh, you're taking the time to be here with us. Uh, so as a matter of introduction, Nate, I was wondering if you could uh, just share with the audience uh, a little bit about your background, your interests, uh, of course, your passion about the Canyon Ministries as the executive director. Yeah, Henry. So, you know, growing up, I always had a big love for science and geology and things like that. And at one point, I thought that's what I was going to go into and become a geologist. Uh, God had other plans, called me into ministry. So I went to seminary, uh, became a pastor. And at that point, I thought I was never going to use rocks and geology in the church, you know, or anything like that. So why even look into it? Um, a little while into that, got involved, though, in creation science and realizing that God has done amazing things in our world around us and things that are left within the rocks, you might say, that point to his word being true. And so now I actually get the opportunity to use both two passions, God's word and those rocks and geology, put them together and teach about God's creation and teach about geology from a biblical creation perspective, you might say, at the best place in the world, which of course is the Grand Canyon. Uh, it's good stuff. Uh, you know, uh, I've, I've, several of my colleagues have had extensive pastoral background, and it helps enormously in doing this kind of ministry, even though you're not doing pastoral work, the work of the local church. It's, it's an enormous asset to understanding uh, the needs of the church. Mm -hmm. And so, so with that in mind, Nate, uh, you know, give us, a, give us an overview of, of Canyon Ministries and, you know, what, what it is you do and, and sort of a, 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 a sense of that kind of thing. Yeah, so Canyon Ministries was founded back in 1997. And so we have been serving guests at the Grand Canyon, starting off with just river trips. And so we do four, seven, and nine-day whitewater rafting trips through the Grand Canyon from a biblical creation and flood perspective. Um, and then we expanded about 10 years ago into doing daily tours along the rim. So rim tours to all the best overlooks of the park. And then have since expanded into daily hiking tours, uh, daily walking tours along the rim, and now most recently backpacking trips. So anywhere from three to five day backpacking trips, you know, down in and across the Grand Canyon and other places like up in Utah and the surrounding landscape. So when it comes to Grand Canyon, we really cover this place from top to bottom and everywhere in between. And so it's a fantastic place to see all this stuff. And so that's what we're doing for about, last year we served about 3,500 people through our trips and tours of the Grand Canyon. This year it looks like we're going to definitely be breaking that number. And so it's fantastic to see how many people want to come out to see and experience the Grand Canyon, uh, again, from a biblical perspective. That's a, uh, that's a pretty wide array of offerings that you, ha that you have, because people can <laughs> certain people are only disposed to do certain things. You know, for some people, a trip down the canyon for a week or something might not work for them, but these other, these other components. Right. So tell us about your staff a little bit, Nate. Like, uh, uh, how, many, how many staff uh, work for the ministry or, or, or work for you, I guess, as the executive uh, director? Tell us, tell us a little bit about, about your staff. Yeah, so we have a fantastic team of guides. Um, we've got about 10 people that are you know, on staff. We've got more that we're hiring. We're actually looking at hiring multiple people this year and next year. And um, because we're just exploding with the numbers of people on these tours. So as God brings more people to see the canyon from this perspective, uh, we need to hire more people to allow those opportunities and especially expanding our backpacking program. In fact, a great thing was last night, I was doing a tour along the rim, and we had a backpacking trip that launched yesterday. And at sunset, I was able to look down at the bottom of the canyon through our binoculars and actually see our guests and our guides walking down way far down below us. So it was kind of fun. But yeah, we have a fantastic team of guides and a lot of people that work in the office as far as the staff and things like that. And so God has just blessed us with one of the best teams on the planet, I think. Oh, that's great. Now, um, I'm thinking some people watching the show, maybe tuning in to Digging for Truth for the first time, are, are, are saying, wait, I, I know about the Grand Canyon, but I was told in school that, you know, this was formed by a long, over long periods of time by the Colorado River. That was the standard view, or at least it used to be the view. It's probably maybe changed a little bit from a secular standpoint. Maybe explain a little bit about 
uh, some of that, just give people a sort of orient them with that, and then uh, a little tutorial on the alternative view that we would hold to. Yeah, so over the history of the Grand Canyon, there has certainly been lots of different theories and ideas that have been presented over all that time. Um, you know, the most popular theory you hear nowadays, of course, is the Colorado River carved the Grand Canyon over about five and a half to six million years, perhaps, slowly, gradually removing all that sediment out of there. Um, however, believe it or not, there's actually a growing group of everyday geologists that are looking at that model and saying it just doesn't seem to add up quite well. And so what we've actually been presenting is kind of what some other groups are starting to come around to. Um, and that is that maybe not the Colorado River slowly carving it, but perhaps a big kind of a lake spillover or breach dam idea. And that's kind of our leading idea when it comes to the Grand Canyon, that we believe looking at the sediment layers in the canyon, that those layers were deposited by and large by the flood in, in Noah's day. Most of those layers from the uh, Tapete sandstone near the bottom all the way up to the Kaibab limestone we see deposited during this year-long global flood catastrophe that the Bible describes in Genesis 6, 7, and 8. And then uh, after that, a few hundred years perhaps even after that, there was a really big, massive interior lake inside the Colorado Plateau that held thousands of cubic miles of water. And that lake system rose up, spilled over this Kaibab Plateau, breached this wall, and a huge amount of water came rushing through, carving the canyon rapidly, catastrophically. And so I, those ideas have been out there for decades now. In fact, Dr. Steve Austin, a well-known research geologist, has actually wrote a book on that called Grand Canyon Monument to Catastrophe that was published in the mid-90s. And so that theory is actually not even a new theory. A breached model or a massive spill of water has been proposed all the way back into the 1800s by geologists like John S. Newberry. And nowadays, some of these other geologists and some people that I know working up at the canyon are saying, maybe we ought to relook at how these models work because... Just looking at the physical difficulties of the Colorado River carving the Grand Canyon kind of says pretty obviously that theory just doesn't hold a lot of water. And what you might say does is a lot of water. What we're talking about, a huge massive spillover. And so it's kind of a two-part scenario that we're looking at. The flood in Noah's day deposits the sediment full of all those fossils and things like that that we find. And then after that, a smaller local regional flood of thousands of cubic miles washes through and rips it out rapidly and pretty catastrophically we would say well that's a that's a great that, that's a great summary you know so you're looking at sort of like a post flood catastrophe a short uh, shortly after the flood is what i hear you describing interesting how mm -hmm. uh interesting how some of the the secular secular people wouldn't ascribe it to Noah and a few thousand years ago, but at least they're, they're admitting some kind of catastrophism, which I guess is getting them in the right direction anyway, right, from our perspective. It, it's, right. Not, it's not getting them there, but it's getting them going in the right direction. Well, that's great stuff. Well, Nate, we're gonna take a break and we're gonna be right back after this message. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website, lighthousetv.org, for more information. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your host, Henry Smith. Today I'm here with Nate Loper. He's the executive uh, director, excuse me, of Canyon Ministries. And we're talking about the formation of the Grand Canyon, but also talking about trips that uh, his group offers and tours uh, that you and your family can go to uh, to get a different view of the Grand Canyon, a view we think his, that is actually the right one based on the flood in the days of Noah. Okay, Nate, you gave us a great uh, tutorial um, on uh, the formation of the canyon, the, the current theory and the creation uh, movement. Talk a little bit, if you would, about fossils, because that's that's something that is everybody's, a lot of people love that subject. I remember when I was a kid, my, my grandmother gave me a, a fish fossil <laughs> and I had it for a long time. I, I regret that I don't have it anymore. I wish I, wish I did have it, but um, let, let's talk about fossils because the, the fossils can tell us a lot about uh, what happened in the past. 
Yeah, Henry, you're exactly right. You know, uh, not only at the Grand Canyon, but around the world, we find a massive fossil record. And so this fossil record, really, we believe, is a record of the catastrophic flood event in Noah's day. And it's the exact kind of thing you would expect to find. You know, you'd expect to find a massive worldwide death and burial event with sedimentary layers that were deposited by water. And within those water-laid sedimentary layers, we find billions upon billions of, of fossils throughout the planet. And so looking at it, you know, fossilization is not a typical occurrence. We don't find things fossilizing today. You know, things that die today, uh, they decompose. And things even in the ocean that die, they float, they bloat, they get picked apart by scavengers, uh, they get eaten and consumed. And so what we see that fossilization is typically the result of a rapid burial by sediments. Things that were once living are now, you know, rapidly buried and they are entombed in sediment. They're not decomposing, they're kept in an oxygen-free or anaerobic environment so they don't naturally decay and decompose. And then the surrounding minerals replace those organic components. And so what we see is that fossilization, every time we seem to look at it, it's seems to be a catastrophic event. And so, of course, when we look at the massive fossil record, that screams a massive catastrophic event. And so even the fossil record we see is not a record of rising, you know, progression of evolution over millions of years. The way we see the fossil record, you know, starting with the deep ocean environments, the near shore environments, shoreline environments, and up onto the land, it's really a sequence of burial from the rising floodwaters in Noah's day. The first environments to be affected by the flood, as we would see from Genesis 7:11, telling us the fountains of the deep that were Tehom, meaning the oceans. The fountains of the deep would be the ocean environments. And so those are the first environments and ecosystems to be thrust onto the continents. Those are the first things to be buried in that sequence from the flood. And then near shore environments and things like that, as we are rising up onto the land, then we see more environments and ecosystems buried in sequence. The fossil record is not a sequence of evolutionary progression, we believe. It's a rev it's a progression of the rising floodwaters. And so, of course, it makes sense because that's what you'd expect to find with a global flood. Um, all this massive watery graveyard around our planet, if you will. Well, that's great. Um, any, any particular type of fossils in the canyon itself that you find of interest or that you think the audience would uh, find of interest or, or maybe anomalies or something strange, uh, whatever you want to share about that, I'd be interested to know. Yeah, we find a lot of fossils, uh, mostly marine fossils are what we find at the Grand Canyon. And of course, those are some of the earliest layers. Uh, the Tapete sandstones that we see there, that layer of rock, we believe, is kind of the beginning of the flood in Noah's day that you can typically see from the rim. And that layer of rock, that Tapete sandstone, goes across multiple continents. You can trace that same layer across North America, across North Africa, into Europe, into Asia. But even within there, in that very first layer, we find interesting fossils like trilobites. Now, trilobites are pretty advanced little creatures already. They have a you know, 40 lens compound eye, and uh, there are no, no evolutionary precursors below that. That tapete sandstone represents what we call the Cambrian explosion or the Cambrian explosion of life, which is a major mystery to most evolutionary biologists because it's an explosion around the world. It's a worldwide physical feature. We find basically no fossil precursors leading up to that. And all of a sudden, there's just an explosion within the fossil record worldwide. It also coincides with a massive, you know, erosional event known as the Great Unconformity. It's a physical feature we find where the layers don't really match up, so they call this a Great Unconformity. And what it is, it's a worldwide erosional feature. You can see the same Great Unconformity in southern Israel near Timna, where you've got Solomon's Pillars down there. You actually have the Great Unconformity right there with the same basal sandstone unit that we see there, we call the Tapete Sandstone over here and different names in different regions. And right away, we find fossils within that that have no evolutionary development in them. And it seems to be not an explosion of life as if life suddenly exploded into existence, but it's an explosion, Henry, of death. Death beginning with the flood in Noah's day. And that explosion of death worldwide coincides with worldwide water erosion with that great unconformity. Two major features, both geology and biology, Coinciding it together, uh, coinciding together, which I feel is tremendous evidence for the beginning of this flood in Noah's day. The fossils, you know, are tremendous evidence of that worldwide death and burial. Yeah, that, that's great stuff. You know, you were you were emphasizing there the tapete sandstone and the unconformity, both uh, what would we would call them transcontinental uh, features. 
right? Mm -hmm. So not just, so, so the regional event of the carving out of the canyon can be explained by a regional event post-flood, mm -hmm. but the, the features themselves have to be explained some kind of uh, large scale catastrophe worldwide. And then uh, if I'm following you right, you're also correlating the, the, the biological creatures that have been found coordinated with that, uh, such as the trilobites. Am I, mm -hmm. under, am I understanding that right? And uh, would you like to yeah. add, add anything to that if you would? Yeah, so when you look at that to Pete Sandstone below there, there are pretty much no fossil record, only single cells, organisms like cyanobacteria, blue-green algae mats that grow, you know, we call stromatolites, which are still growing today in calm and placid seas, not these big death and burial fossils. But in that to Pete Sandstone, we see an explosion within the fossil record that represents almost every major phyla of life known to man instantaneously without seeing evolutionary precursors leading up to it. And again, that is also on a worldwide scale. So if you have the same to Pete Sandstone here at the Grand Canyon, and most Americans have that underneath their house, and you can trace it all the way across North Africa, and you can see it into Israel and into Jordan, when you have the same dirt from here to there, and it's been deposited by water, well, yes. Henry, that is a fast-moving worldwide water event. And so to have the same event, to have the same features requires that same, you know, same event, same mechanism. And then in that, we see the explosion within the fossil record again, an explosion not of life, because life existed from creation until the flood. But like today's, you know, today's present world, we don't find things fossilizing. That explosion is an explosion of death, of death and burial, beginning with that to peach sandstone. That's why we see the fossil record start there. That's why we see a worldwide erosion start there and then on up to the very top of the Grand Canyon layers to the Kaibab limestone and even layers that were deposited above that that we tend to see kind of part of the grand staircase as you go up towards the north, towards Utah. Super. Well, in our next segment, Nate, we're going to ta talk to the audience. You're going to tell them about everything that you're describing, how they can come and see it. And we'll do that in our next segment. Please don't go away. We'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. I'm here with Nate Loper, who's the executive director of Canyon Ministries. And he's just been giving us exciting evidence that's consistent with the claim that the account in Genesis 6 through 9, Noah's flood, actually happened in history. Okay, uh, Nate, uh, let's, we've, we've been talking about these features. One of the biggest ones is what we mentioned a couple of times, the transcontinental features. Um, uh, people going, okay, I can see pictures, and we're going to put pictures up for people, but uh, there's something more exciting to offer here, and that is coming to see this in person. So let's start, yeah. let's start with probably what would be most doable for people traveling, uh, our, our members of our audience, and that would be your rim, the rim tours, the Canyon Rim Tours. Let's start there. Yeah, absolutely, Henry. So the rim tours that we do, that is the main thing that we end up doing because most people tend to do that pretty easily. Um, we have like a four-hour tour along the rim, either a morning tour that starts at 8 a.m. and it finishes around noon. And then our most popular tour actually is our daily sunset tours that start about four hours before the sunset and then conclude with that sunset. And so those, uh, those sunset tours our fantastic way to not only see the majority of the, the features of the canyon because we traveled to about four or five different overlooks, but also really close out the day with the one who made it and opportunity to really sit there and see God's beauty on display as the sun is going down over the Grand Canyon. So that's kind of the most popular tour that we do. We also offer a full day, 11 hour triple park tour, which includes Grand Canyon, Native American archeology span and ruins and Wupatki National Monument and Sunset Crater Volcano. So kind of continuing the story after the flood, you know, uh, we get into migration from the Tower of Babel and Ice Age events and things like that. And so we kind of cover this 11 hours of three different major parks. 
And so those kind of are the rim tours and that triple park tour are probably the most easy of all the tours for people to get into. And um, that's what people tend to enjoy the most out there. Do you largely offer your tours uh, year round, Nate, or is there a time when you have an off season? We offer them year round. So almost every day, you know, except for major holidays and uh, every day except for Sunday. We don't do tours on Sundays, but okay. six days a week we're out there running trips and tours of the Grand Canyon. Multiple okay. tours every day happening. All right, so people can go online to Canyon Ministries and find out how to book, how much it costs, mm -hmm. how far in advance, what to pack, all the stuff that they need. All I, that stuff. All that stuff is there, all the practical stuff. Great place to go for to take your family vacation. Homeschoolers, I can imagine uh, you get a lot of homeschoolers that come and, and, and mm -hmm. do that. It's just, just it's so exciting. I, Nate, I haven't been to the Grand Canyon since 1977, <laughs> 78 with, oh, my, with my grandmother. And, uh, you, you know, uh, so it's been a long time. So now you're, I, I've got to get this on my radar uh, and come and come and see you. OK, but uh, bef we have some more to talk about, and that is the more extensive trips that you offer. Mm -hmm. Please, please talk about that, like uh, how they're broken down and give us a general overview of, of what they are, uh, what's involved, please. Yeah, absolutely. So. Apart from the rim tours that we're talking about, we also do daily hiking tours down in the Grand Canyon. Those are about a six-hour hiking trip, kind of a three-mile round trip down into parts of the canyon and back out. And then um, kind of on top of that, we have multi-day backpacking trips. And so some of those are just down one side and you know staying down below. Other backpacking trips actually go all the way across the Grand Canyon, kind of a rim to rim that we talk about. And those are four days in length. And so most of those major backpacking trips are usually in the spring and in the fall when it's not blazing hot at the Grand Canyon. But the Grand Canyon is fantastic to visit any time of year because the rim is 7,000 feet in elevation. So unlike Phoenix, where it's roasting down south, we actually have some pretty good temperatures. But of course, backpacking in the Grand Canyon, we try to do that spring and fall. So on our website, you can find out information about that. We also offer multiple backpacking opportunities, as well as backpacking through beautiful slot canyons up in Utah, where you have beautiful waterfalls, rock arches you're sleeping underneath, Native American archaeology, uh, dinosaur trackways, even a visit to Bryce Canyon National Park as part of that whole trip. So those are multi-day backpacking trips. And then our river trips that we've been running now for 26 years are um, four, seven, and nine days in length of the Grand Canyon. And so the seven and nine day trips start at the very beginning of the Grand Canyon, and they raft 187 miles over the course of that trip. And then we helicopter out of the Grand Canyon at that point. And then the four day trips, we start at that same place we just ended at with the other trip, and we helicopter down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and go the lower 90 miles into Lake Mead. And so all these different trips have different lengths, some different styles. Some trips have bigger rapids on them. Some trips have smaller rapids. Some have massive waterfalls. And so just amazing experience, no matter which type of trip you would do. And everything we do, every trip we do and we cover is done from a biblical creation of flood perspective. So you're not only seeing what we have, not only learning why we have it, but really the most important thing is you're learning what is the significance of a place like the Grand Canyon? What does it tell us? What does it speak to us about? And in many ways, the Grand Canyon, the beauty of the landscape shows us the redemption in the heart of God. And so all of that is incorporated in every trip and tour that we offer. Excellent. Excellent. OK, so basically it's it's a, a spectrum from four hours to over a week. So right. if, if it fits your fits any need or any ability that you have to go. So there's no excuse not to do it if you can if you can get to Arizona to go and see yeah. Canyon, Canyon Ministries. OK, Nate, I'm going to give you the hard task of giving you about a minute and a half to tell the audience. Why does this matter? Maybe somebody new who's tuning in for the first time to Digging for Truth. Uh, why are we why are we grappling about things with science and the flood? Can we just talk about Jesus? Tell us tell us why this is important. Yeah, Henry, it's absolutely important, I, I feel, because when you look at the flood in Noah's day, God had to send judgment. You know, the Bible describes the world in Noah's day as a wicked place. All flesh was violent. Now, God saw that wickedness and violence, and of course, with that understanding and in, in what would happen if that level of wickedness had been allowed to continue, God decided to send that flood um, to judge the world and to remove that level of wickedness. And also, in many ways, it shows us the holiness of who God is. But here's the interesting thing. God could have destroyed the world and left it a complete, utter wasteland, but he didn't. He gave us incredible beauty even from the flood. When I look at the Grand Canyon, what we see here is that there's evidence that God is a God of love. God is a God of redemption and of restoration. We see amazing beauty in a world that God has given us. And a lot of this, especially things like the Grand Canyon, those layers are the result of the flood. 
So while we're standing on top of a massive watery graveyard from that catastrophe, what we're really looking at in many ways is a place that shows the beauty and the love of God that millions of people every year can come and see. And it shows us that God is a God of redemption and restoration. In Noah's day, we see the ark provided as a way of salvation. And all people had to do in that day to receive that way of salvation from the flood was step through the door of that ark. Today, we have a coming judgment, but we have a way of salvation, not through a wooden door and a wooden ark, but through the doorway, which is Jesus Christ. And in fact, that's exactly what Christ said, Behold, I am the door. And if anyone would enter through me, they will find salvation. Jesus refers and shows himself as a doorway of salvation, and that salvation is freely offered to all who will believe. And in many ways, the canyon is a testimony, is a reminder. And Henry, you might even say those rocks cry out as a testimony, speaking of the truth and veracity of God's Word from the very beginning to the very end, and showing us the love of God every single day on display. You said it all right there, Nate. Uh, the offer of the gospel uh, is, is the message of the flood, and we thank you, for, mm-hmm. thank you for your hard work. Thank you for coming on the show. And friends, thank you for joining us on Digging for Truth.